The kid raises his hand and asks to be excused because his brain is full. <laughs> yeah. So the, this other thing, because I almost forgot it again. <laughs> Sorry. The, the February freeze is coming. Yes. And apparently, I did not read my contract well enough because it's in there. <laughs> that once a year, I have to go and be immersed, go splash around in the Chesapeake Bay at not a time that most people would choose to do so. <laughs> um, so there will be information coming out concerning fundraising for that. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of set the bar like we did. The addition I'm going to make though, and this will be on the honor system, is I'm going to ask on top of a financial contribution like last year, that we, that people commit, that they pledge, they covenant to hours of service for Habitat, okay? So you, you, the picture will come out, it'll look quite nice like last year. I did a good job with it, the little line drawing, my little floaty, my cement shoes. Um, um, so look, look for that coming out. Bill's getting first. Same place? Yes, Cape, Cape Charles. Um, Cape Charles, so. Hopefully they won't have to break up any ice or anything like that. So. Never had to do that. Never had to do that. All right, so. Another tangent. I, I, uh, I went to a prayer service on Friday, and I got to have a lovely conversation with a fellow from Turkmenistan, part of the old Soviet Union. And um, we were talking about this, and he looked at me, he's like, you know, the Russians used to do that, and we never understood it. <laughs> Cut a hole in the ice and get in. He said, is it like a, like a baptism thing? I'm like, no, it's not a baptism thing. It's just... <laughs> Pardon? A purchase order for what? Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. We'll have Mick sign the check. <laughs> so the second scripture reading continues the story that we had started with, picking up with the ninth verse. We remember that the individual had come out um, and was talking to Jesus. Then Jesus asked the man, asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was on the hillside a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. The very man who had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused. And said to him, Go to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. It's important to go and read the texts around the stories that we're doing to get a sense of the movement within any of the scriptures that we read within the gospels and in this case within Mark. Because if we were to go back and read just what happened before, we would find the disciples had just survived a stormy lake crossing. They had just survived going across from where they were, their home, their place of being. And they had crossed this lake where the forces of chaos were raising up around them. And it felt like a formless void was looking to, to draw them in. And they cried out, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And then they land 
on the shore, this tempest-tossed group. And they're in a foreign land with its foreign culture and its foreign ways of being. They're not in Kansas anymore. Their world had changed. This beginning of Jesus' ministry, this, this initial set of moves, has changed the world that they live in. They had actually literally left. And for some of them, they have possibly never left. Never been somewhere where they were not the majority culture. Now, even living at home, they were an oppressed people, but you could at least count on your neighbors to be like you. The world had changed. Crossing the sea, the world had changed. But, you know, truth be told, we don't have to go anywhere to feel the terror of a changing world. We can stay just where we are, and it will come to us. Even if we sit very, very still in the hopes that change will not occur, It will happen. Immediately, in the case of Mark's gospel, immediately the world has changed. And there's no let up to this rapid pace of things. It's mind boggling. It's it's disorienting. We were just back in Capernaum with the guy being lowered down from the roof. By his friends. We were just in Capernaum where we were wrestling with parables and struggling with what the heck is Jesus talking about? And now we have been literally tossed by the storm over to another shore. There's no let up. We were just getting started, and there's no let up. Because just as we're getting our feet underneath of us on this beach and we're trying to sort of wring out our clothes, maybe the day has turned sunny after the storm, just as we're trying to dry ourselves off and get a little sense of normalcy about us again, taking in the way the world has turned, this guy shows up. Now, it is obvious from a distance that this guy has no sense of social propriety. I mean, he might not be like us, but it is obvious that he is just disconnected from the world. He has no social restraints. He doesn't reflect any sort of social expectations or laws. I mean, this is what makes us a people. This is what causes civilization to be formed, right? We have expectations, the way you dress and the way you act, and then, you know, even if you eat pork barbecue with vinegar, (laughs) the food of heaven itself. This guy doesn't reflect any of that. He is this totally foreign creature, and not only is he beyond social constraints, kind of language he uses. Can't believe he kisses his mama with that mouth. <laughs> He's beyond physical restraint as well. He's torn out of the frame and tormented. He cannot live among the living or the civilized. He is unbound. He is disordered. He's chaos. Just like the stormy waters that we just crossed. Just like the formless void of creation. It's chaos. Now, we don't have to remove people far from us. We can actually have people remain in their own homes and they can be functionally exiled. 
or encapsulated, those that seem to lack social restraints, those who are beyond physical restraint in some way, we don't need to necessarily put them in a cemetery. We can shunt them aside in this society, and nowadays we are tempted to even step over them. Turn our heads and ponder something else as we go by, these folks who cannot live among the living. Folks who have been deemed, by whatever measure, unfit to be part of civilized society. We can draw red lines on maps to contain them. We can create ghettos. Tomorrow is 75 years since the liberation of Auschwitz. We can create food deserts, places where there are not any good sense of health care available. The comedian George Carlin once suggested that we can take the square-sided states, the rectangular states, and just fence them and put all of the unwanted people in there, like Colorado or Kansas. We don't have to remove people far. We have been pretty creative as a society in finding ways to shunt aside those who are beyond social restraint or physical restraint. Those who we deem are not part of society in a meaningful way. Those who aren't like us. Those who represent change and struggle And we feel that struggle, don't we? You know, last week we learned we have to keep struggling for the realm. And to struggle for the realm and with the realm means we have to be changed. We must change. Even as we are sitting, very still, seeking to avoid it. We're thrown up on the shore and we're trying to figure all this out. And there is this poor soul again. The one who's impossible to hold down. Chaos embodied. And he runs. He runs, closing the gap between us in an inordinately fast and very disturbing sort of way. Conversation when I was in North Carolina with an officer who was in the district who explained why you cannot keep your sidearm holstered in certain situations. Because that sh- brief period of going from holster to a position to be able to defend yourself, someone can close a lot of territory very quickly. I never thought about it, it was disturbing. It was scary. This guy closes the gap. This chaos closes the gap in a quick and disturbing way. And our reaction as disciples is, don't make contact. Don't make eye contact. It's like a cat. You look at them, they come at you. Just don't make eye contact. (laughs) They're coming this way. Just pretend they don't exist. And yet they come so quickly. Chaos comes barreling in so quickly. And at the last possible minute, when we are certain that Jesus is about to get taken out, notice there's nothing in the gospel about a disciple jumping in front of him. We are human beings. This unrestrained and unrestrainable individual bows. They are struggling as well. They are wrestling with what is going on as well. I bow, but my pride makes my neck stiff in the bowing. 
I bow, but my self-importance fortifies my mind. I bow, but my narcissism hardens my heart. My time is precious to me, and yet I find a way to bow in some way. We get a sense of that wrestling that this person is going through, and we are told that they are legion. That's a lot, by the way. It's not a term that's used enough to describe things anymore. Legion. 6,000 occupying soldiers sent from the seat of empire to keep the peace of the Pax Romana. An occupying peace for those who are living day to day. An imperial peace for those of us who benefit from the rule of the empire. A peace at the end of a pointy stick for those who might dare to protest. No peace for this poor soul, this chaos embodied individual. No peace for those who have struggled between the life of empire and the life of the realm of God that has come so near. Now sometimes it is hard for us to tell where that dividing line is between the healing and the torment. The stiff-necked bow, the, the chaos that is somehow being drawn into a place of control and order again. It's hard to sort of find that line between being the living and the walking dead. But the miracle in this story is evident. In this moment, in this story, there is a place of wholeness. God God has broken in. Genesis talks about the spirits moving across the formless void and bringing order to chaos. The spirit, the face of God, the word of God. Mark says this is the good news, bringing order to this chaos and chaotic being. And God has brought some clarity to the struggle. And this individual who has bowed, this legion who has been forced into containment again, reacts to the presence of God in their lives And what is this reaction? Well, they beg. Legion begs to be sent away. And the individual begs to accompany Jesus. In this moment, when we are so close to the realm of God, dangerously close, at your elbow close, In this moment when we have gathered perhaps even at the table itself, in this moment of proximity, we are begging to accompany. And we are begging to be sent away. We want to cleave and we want to flee. Let me stay Let me go. We sing nearer my God to thee. And we seek to hide our faces. Let me stay. And let me run. This individual in chaos is struggling. The disciples who are going through change are struggling. We who have come so close are struggling because we are called and we are sent. The cure that we have sought in our lives, the relationship with God has adverse side effects. We cannot be the same. We might be sent out to deliver the good news, to witness to what God has done to and for us. We might be asked to be church on this day. We might be asked to cross a great chaotic void, divide, to change, to struggle, to bow, even though we resist. 
we might not get what we ask for. Instead, being charged with some other sacred duty. You cannot come with me in this moment, Jesus tells him, but you need to go to your home and tell people what God has done for you. You need to go out and spread the good news. Let me be close to you. Let me hide from you. Let me be the same, even though I must be changed. <clears throat> Let me walk among the living, even though I have found some comfort walking with the dead. But the promise for us on this day is the same promise that that individual received, the same promise that the disciples received, that we will not be church alone. That God reaches out. God seeks continually to bring order to the forces of chaos. To restore, to rescue, to, to embrace. Maybe not in the ways that we expect, but in the ways of God. The Spirit continues to move across the deep. To create and to recreate. And just as the disciples found themselves, just as this demoniac found himself, Jesus is present in the struggle. Jesus, the resurrected one, the living who walks among the living. Thanks be to God. And amen.